Hello and welcome to Reading the Past, I'm Dr Cat. What I would like to talk to you about today is value and specifically value crises. I think that a lot of history and particularly when exploring material culture, people focus on aspiration. There's the seminal text Renaissance self-fashioning. We have looked to understand our forebears through what they aspired to, through what they chose to put on their bodies in order to shape their identity and to shape themselves. Something that I think has been not necessarily ignored but somewhat overlooked in favour of these kind of aspirational explorations is what people abjected, what they wishes, wished to remove from their lives, remove from their societies and remove from their world. An example I give is if you were uh, dropped from a spaceship into the heart of King's Cross St Pancras in London, you would look around the concourse there and see that there were no waste bins. And indeed in, in many central London train stations you would find it quite difficult to find a bin. Now, if you were an alien and only looked at what people were aspiring to in our nation, you might think, oh, well, this is about wanting to be greener, to save the environment, to cut down on waste, to inspire recycling. And that would perhaps be quite a good call on that issue. But actually, of course, the reason why there are no bins is a matter of concern, fear, anxiety, over the potential for terrorist activity to take place and bombs to be placed in bins. So to understand that space more fully, you have to look at the history of what people reject more so than what they aspire towards. My doctoral thesis focused on how the words trash and trifles got used in a span of about 100 years from the early 1500s to the early 1600s. And I chose those words, but particularly trash, because the meaning of that word is layered upon in the early 1500s. Prior to around about 1519, there isn't really a recorded use of trash as a noun. It's a verb. In the text Magnificence by John Skelton or Shelton, the name is represented both ways, the Prince figure, Magnificence, is mocked for the loss of his plate of silver and such trash. This is the first extant example of this word being used to describe something as valueless. However, in my study and exploration, I found that trash in this period wasn't simply something that was valueless. It was something that was destructive. Its very worthlessness made it dangerous. And in my thesis, I looked at how the term gets used in response to Reformation. So we have papal trish trash. I looked at how it was used to discuss and develop themes about the anxiety of international trading. In the world of kind of economic discussion and economic discourse, English writers start talking about trash and trifles as something that needs to be kept away from the nation or certainly kept in balance with the nation's treasure. The new world becomes something that they they use to say this is a place where we can place our trash. In fact English writers promoting new world discovery and exploration seem to be very much pushing this idea that English trash and trifles can be given to the natives who don't know any better, they are innocents and Therefore, we can take away their pearls, their gold, their silver, and we can give them our buttons and broken beads and bits of old mirror. It's not nice, but it's certainly the language that is being used. Now, on all of those three preceding things, I'm quite happy to do another video talking about those in more depth. But today, what I want to talk about specifically is, is the last chapter of my thesis and something that I think is particularly interesting because it looks at the notion of cultural trash. And in early modern England, this was essentially the professional theatres, the all-male playing stages of Shakespeare and his contemporaries. 
So previously I gave 1519 as an approximate date, a best guess date, should we say, for the word trash first being used as a noun. We need to go slightly later in the century to see a time where there is a complete shift for professional players, playwrights and theatre makers, particularly to around about 1567. On or by this year, the Red Lion is built and this is the first purpose-built professional playing stage. It precedes the theatre, the curtain, the globe, etc etc I will um, find some I've got a lovely map that I can link to show you the layout of these spaces what's particularly interesting is whereabouts in London they sit the vast majority of these purpose-built playing spaces sit outside of the city walls London is now not a walled city you can move freely through the streets coming into the city and out of it but in Shakespeare's time, it was a walled city. We still have uh, hints of it. We have Moorgate, Aldgate, Cripplegate. There is London Wall is a road. And what this marked was a difference in political power. So going from the tower in the east, there is a wall that comes all the way around. And inside that wall, the intramural, that space is under the control of London's City Council. They certainly aren't big fans of playing or any kind of entertainments where lots of people can gather and they believe that potentially insurrection could be mounted, but also things could be discussed and talked about that lead people away from a righteous and religious path. They are concerned that the theatres are spaces that compete with religious houses, that the players are idolatrous and dangerous to the spiritual welfare of the people. They frequently refer to the playing companies and their wares as trash. Stephen Gosson says, let us but shut up our ears to poets, pipers and players. Pull our feet back from re resort to theatres and turn away our eyes from beholding of vanity. The greatest storm of abuse will be overblown and a fair path trodden to amendment of life. Were we not so foolish to taste every drug and buy every trifle, players would shut in their shops and carry their trash to some other country. Similarly, 1583, Philip Stubbs in The Anatomy of Abuses says, the shameless gestures of players serve nothing so much as to move the flesh to lust and uncleanness. No Christian man or woman should resort to plays or interludes, where is nothing but blasphemy, scurrility and whoredom maintained. So it's perhaps quite difficult for us to understand that at the time, these were perceived as being valueless, trashy, dangerous, effeminizing, and I think that that's a, that's a particularly useful word. The accusations that the theatre, the plays, the players effeminate the mind is a particularly useful, if not confusing thing for us to grasp now. But this is where our past and our present can merge quite nicely. Because if we think today about what we call our cultural trash, our trash TV, our trash magazines particularly, I think it's quite interesting. Because our trashy magazines are not things like FHM or Men's Health. They are things like hello or okay or even things like vogue they are products that are produced for by and with women similarly trash tv it's not things like wrestling programs or football 
or Top Gear. These these are not, I should also mention, other TV programmes and magazine subscriptions are of course available, but, but those are not trash TV. Trash TV are chat shows, reality TV, uh, at the moment everybody's going mad over Love Island, but they talk about it as a guilty pleasure, as trash TV. They acknowledge that what they are watching is trash. Now, these programmes are specifically geared towards, they are marketed at women. In a number of cases, particularly with reality TV, I'm thinking of a famous bunch of sisters in America, it's majoritively starring women. And I'd like to interrogate just why we are quite so happy to acknowledge that things made for, by and with women are trash. What does it say about our culture that we allow this to be how it's viewed? Why are we doing this? What does it say about the place of women that the things that are marketed for and to them are valueless and implicitly destructive? Something that's particularly interesting to me is that while the cultural trash that we have now almost seems to revel in its status as being valueless. It, it acknowledges it, it owns it, it sometimes seems to celebrate it and play up to it. Everybody is oddly complicit in this shared valuation that this thing is valueless and potentially destructive and infectious. However, we accept that about it take it on board and run with it and still are able to enjoy it. We choose to absorb this threat and enjoy it. It's like, I understand, I take that on board, I'm going to continue enjoying this thing. For the early moderns, the theatres in particular are very, very keen to reject this notion that they are valueless and destructive. And of course, what the theatre has that uh, papal objects like pardons or bulls or statues or, for example, trade objects like cloth, uh, wool, fruit, what the theatre offers as a commodity that these other things cannot is the capacity to speak back, to answer the allegations. Because it is a text-based media and has the capacity to be an aural and oral means of dissemination, it has the ability to argue its case. Thomas Hayward in the Apology for Actors of 1612 launches just such a defence. He says, quote, plays are writ with this aim and carried with this method, to teach the subjects obedience to their king to show the people the untimely ends of such as have moved tumults, commotions and insurrections, to present them with the flourishing estate of such as live in obedience, exhorting them to allegiance, dehorting them from all traitorous and felonious stratagems. For Hayward, then, the theatrical space is a place in which the community is protected, it goes back almost to that sacred space of the ancient theatres whereby a catharsis can occur. The broken bits of society can be healed, mended. We can teach about how to fix them even, perhaps. The theatre is, Hayward saying anyway, a laboratory space, uh, an experimental location, a classroom in which audiences are shown how to be better Englishmen and women. I think this is perhaps another reason why women are not permitted on the professional playing stage. It is a myth universally believed that it was illegal for women to act on the stages of early modern England and this is not the case. It's not against the law for women to perform, it is the player's choice and it is a peculiarly English choice. The European theatre companies are mixed-gendered. 
it's only England that has these all male companies. Now, there are a variety of reasons why this, this may be occurring, but for me, this is about them attempting to assert a masculine authority in their work. They do not have the recognition of being a guild or the protection that being a guild offers them. But by excluding women from their public face, they are able to present themselves like an all masculine trade guild. And I think that this is why they do it. Now that isn't to say that women don't have roles in the theatre because they certainly did. They are investors, they are shareholders, householders, and they are in the theatre spaces selling oysters or fruit. They are spanglers, decorating costumes. They are gatherers, collecting money. They are sempsters, seamstresses, laundresses, making sure that the linens are clean, that the ruffs are starched and pressed. As Natasha Corder in Labour's Lost points out, this all-male professional playing stage in its newly built location was completely dependent on the labour, wares and financial capital of women of all stripes. It's simply their decision to choose to erase, hide and obscure that place. And I think that that is because they were concerned about being known as trash effeminizing trash that they absolutely reject the place and role of women within their organizations and indeed when it comes to them staging trash which they do it is frequently linked to women and strangers for example in Othello trash is used three times always by Iago. He refers to Rodrigo as trash. Bianca, the courtesan, is trash. He also says, who steals my purse steals trash. While Iago is a Venetian and a member of that community, the Venetian community has, of course, been relocated to Cyprus and is under the headship of a stranger, namely the captain of that particular army, Othello. Iago, in his, in quote, motiveless malignity, is able to subvert that value system for his own designs. Because the stranger is unable to maintain it, Iago can destroy it. And in doing so, he is able to destroy that most flimsy of values, namely female honour. Desdemona, her agency over controlling and maintaining her value is completely lost because she is married to a stranger who doesn't recognise properly her value and is unable to maintain it in his own, own mind and she is of course at the mercy of an Iago who is looking to subvert value constantly. And there are many other examples of the early modern stages staging trash. And I think that this is another moment in which they are attempting to protect themselves. Not only are they no longer vagabonds and itinerants, they have these sturdy playhouse purpose-built spaces. They are, as Hayward suggests, locations in which the morals and ethics and status of the nation can be preserved and protected. When the men of the professional playing stages stage trash, both spiritual and physical, whether that be material goods or people, what they are saying is we are a containment field. We put these things on stage, we discuss them, we take them out of their box and allow them into the world, but in doing so, we teach of their dangers and we contain them in spaces that can cleanse them from our community. Now, I'm not saying this is actually, they were actually capable of doing this. I am saying that this is what they 
are alleging or claiming that they are able to do. So while we as moderns have accepted the valuelessness of the, tr the cultural trash we consume, for our early modern forebears, they are staging trash in an attempt to deny themselves and their place as cultural trash. So while I was thinking of titling this video, Why is Shakespeare like the Kardashians? Perhaps that feels somewhat fraudulent because the Kardashians seemingly are quite happy to acknowledge themselves as reality or trash TV. But I think that that is the last thing that Shakespeare or Marlowe or Johnson or anybody working on these professionals playing stages would have been willing to admit. They are not trash as far as they're concerned because trash is not only valueless, it is infectious and destructive. They are the people that contain trash. They do a civil service almost in doing so. Thank you so much for spending time with me and for letting me talk to you all about trash. Uh, I hope you found this video both valuable and constructive. If you did like it, please like, subscribe, share with a friend. Please click the bell icon next to the subscribe button so that you're going to know when I'm uploading. Any comments you have, please leave them down below. You can also find me on my social media, on Twitter and Instagram. I'll be leaving those links somewhere about these parts. I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the next video. If you've got any particular topics you'd like me to cover, perhaps one of the ones I discussed earlier, you want to hear more about papal trash or economic trash or new world trash, please leave me a comment or come find me on social media and let me know. Or if there's another topic, maybe you want me to do a deep dive on a particular Shakespeare play or there's a question you've had about uh, early modern history that you'd like me to try and answer. Thank you again so much and I'm really looking forward to seeing you again soon. Bye bye for now.